break away from the orthotics? I'm going to dish that one to the physician. <laughs> I, mean, I think it depends. I mean, orthotics have the role for specific dysfunction, so I think if that's a really a one-on-one -on -one type of question, depending on why the orthotics were there. But well, one thing that with orthotic research is just for the general population for injuries, like plantar fasciitis, almost probably everyone in this room has had, the one thing we do know is that custom hard orthotics do worse than your more soft, like a super feast that's non-custom. So the next question is probably, okay, what's going barefoot? No one's even compared that. But most people who actually recover for good from things like plantar fasciitis ultimately throw everything away because they figure out that the more their foot is in a cast, like if you broke your arm and we put it in a cast for three weeks and you took it off, I mean, it felt pretty good when it was in that cast. So then you take that cast off and every single muscle in your arm is like gone. Mm -hmm. So if you're really looking not for like one day of relief, but a, a lifelong of strength and function, maybe put that orthotic, I mean, if it's for that type of thing, like plantar fasciitis, maybe use that orthotic for a day or two. Don't spend 300 bucks, but like basically you got to put your foot in a cast because you can't walk. And then gradually start moving and strengthening your foot. But that's more of a general answer. Some people have horrible bunions, angle abnormalities, and they might need something functional. Um, so. I'm really, I'm really yeah. curious about the orthotic question because um, Gerard Hart, who's a physical therapist, works all right. He says at most two to three percent of the population actually have physical abnormalities. So where are all these other orthotics going? And as far as plantar fasciitis, I had a brutal case of it for months. And the day I got my form, literally that day, it was bizarre. I ran home barefoot to my hotel. It was gone. I've not had a twinge since then. So. Good luck um, on the form. Yeah, it's about the form. It's about form. Yeah, yeah, it's not about the orthotic. It's fix your form and okay. everything else. Your, your plantar fascia is actually under your foot. If you're telling you stretch your can't work, it's got nothing to do with the It's under here. And by changing your form, getting your forefoot, it'll stretch that plantar fascia. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. It's a non shoe related question. Cool. <laughs> um, two things. Where are you mentally when you run? And can you speak a little of your writing process? Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> I appreciate the question. Uh, so yeah, where are you mentally when you run? Um, everywhere. Uh, what was cool was training for the Copper Canyon race. Uh, Eric would send me out these five hour runs. And, and five hours, it's a long time inside your own head. You just ramble around the hills. But it became kind of cool. Like, um, to do this more when you go for a long run, you kind of come with like a checklist of like, there's all the stuff you got to deal with in your life. And okay, now you got like a few hours. I can sort of yeah, things out. Everything comes together. <laughs> yeah. But I actually sort of save stuff, like, you know, things I needed to work on that I knew would be complex. I sort of put them aside and, all right, I'll deal with that when I'm running. Um, and no Walkman or iPod. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, it seems to be totally uh, inexplicable. Like, I'm out there to turn off the noise and wipe a couple more in your head. So, um, yeah, I just, uh, it, it's become a, I, I think one reason I'm so passionate about this kind of stuff is, and not to over-dramatize it into, like, a, uh, you know, 700 club kind of moment, but I feel like I got the use of my legs back. Like this is an activity that is now so important in my life. Um, when I was actually writing the book, the thing was this, a year overdue because I had so much material, I could not figure out how the hell to get all the stuff into one book. And I kept messing it up. I actually wrote a full draft that I had to shred and start over. And did that three times. Because I didn't know how to start this thing. I didn't know where to start it. At one point I started it in Leadville in the 1800s. And I'm halfway through the book, and I'm still in though I haven't gotten to the 20th century yet. <laughs> <laughs> my aunt was like, dude, you're in the wrong country, the wrong century, the wrong city, the wrong race. You know, we haven't seen the Indians yet, you're almost on the book. <laughs> the next time I try to start off with Jen and Billy, make them the focus of the book, and the same deal, I'm almost done the book, and I'm still in Virginia Beach with these two numbers. So, um, what I found was whenever I would uh, be jammed up on a mental problem, couldn't solve it, you just go for a month. And again, you get to the point where you know exactly how many minutes into the run the solution will, will turn up. Uh, so where I'm when I run is wherever, wherever your brain goes. And that's the cool thing is it's almost like you're getting a massage, there's like a knot there, and all of a sudden that knot vanishes. It's like that when you run, like that mental knot just unties. As far as the writing process is concerned, I also learned uh, stop trying to force it. Stop trying to be a power writer like a power runner because you're, you're doomed, I think you're doomed to failure. You're trying to make things work that aren't right. And that's the reason why those drafts didn't work, was I had this idea, I'm gonna make it, and I'm gonna force it, and I'm gonna try to make it happen, and the idea wasn't good enough 
to sustain it and it would fall apart. And what I think I try to do now is just relax, let the story unfold, and not try to force anything. Is that, is that your question about Pokemon? Okay, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have a question about the Pokemon. Um, you know, you have Genesis, you have Pokemon, 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 you Bernadette's asking basically how you can, you know, drink yourself blind like Jen and Billy and then go out there and rip out a fast hundred mile or the next day. Uh, that is the next gonna be the next frontier of physiological research. You know? But no, that's actually uh, to actually answer Bernadette's question, it's kinda of interesting thing. I um it, it works kind of for a cool reason. You know, Ken Clover, the guy who uh, created the Leadville Trail one hundred. He said, you know, if you're running 100 miles, you want to be asleep for the first 50. You don't, you don't even want to wake up to mile 60. And I think that there's, um, again, a kind of a wisdom there, which is about the relaxation principle. Anytime, Jen said, like Jen told me that her best race was the time she ran with a hangover because it's the one time she wasn't folding out of the blocks and trying to beat everybody. She was hung over, she pulled back, and she relaxed, and then halfway through the race, she spent the whole day just drinking fluids and eating food. So, she started to recover from her hangover just in time to take off the wing. Uh, so all you kids out there, take a lesson from Jen Shelton. Um, I think the idea of the Tabu Mata is that again, you know, running is fun, it's communal, this is about fun. Uh, they're having a big old full-on drinking party, they're dancing, having a good time. To not hold them back with that sort of jealous, egotistical notion that if I drink less, I'll win. It's about having a good time. And if we're all drunk and hungover, we're all, we're all hungover together, you know? So nobody has an advantage. It does run counter to our idea of being a little bit more senior. I don't drink like that. Um, but I see, again, a certain wisdom there of having fun and not trying to always be you know, pushing hard. Yes, How often would they have these types of parties and races? I mean, and, you know, is this something they would do maybe every six months? You know, they'd all come together and have a big party for whatever holiday they celebrated, or is this every weekend? Or? Uh, Victor wants to pursue the drinking question. <laughs> <laughs> have you met my friend already? <laughs> uh, the, the, well, there is one stat. This guy named John Kennedy, who the, the great anthropologist of the Double Bottom, he said that they are drunk or hungover one of every three days of the year, which is pretty amazing. Um, but as far as the racing is concerned, that's kind of a big mystery. Nobody really knows. Uh, they race spontaneously, settlement versus settlement. Nobody sees these races. No one's invited. Uh, Kabai's never been invited as long as he's been down there. He's never been invited to either the drinking party or the races. So it's still the vast unknown of the about a racing world. No one really knows. Uh, as far as the drinking is concerned, again, it's not, I don't think it's like sort of the whole fire water, you know, kind of problem. I think. When you have a society that has learned to <coughs> survive by cooperating all the time, every once in a while you got to blow off some steam. So I think this is a great um, 